Let's go through four types of courses. In philosophy courses, like the ones that I teach here at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, the readings are short and dense, and you have to read every word of them, often multiple times. In history courses, by contrast, you'll often be assigned entire books for each class. If that's the case, you're really only supposed to read the introduction and the conclusion, and you sort of skim the chapters in the middle. In lower level science courses, 100 level science courses, with a textbook, sometimes the professor will tell you not to even bother reading the textbook, but you have to read every chapter of the textbook before class on that material. But then, in the upper level science courses, the advanced science courses, where you're no longer reading a textbook, now you're just reading actual scientific articles written by real scientists in academic journals, in these cases, you actually don't read the whole article. You just read some of the introductory material and the, the sort of conclusion stuff, and you go through the figures and carefully read the captions below the figures. I wasn't going to tell you that. I had written a version of this video lecture where I was just gonna give you the standard line that college faculty, like myself, tend to give students, which is that you have to read all of the reading for all of your courses. I was going to do that, but then I started to think back on my own experience as a college student. I graduated summa cum laude, that's the top 2% of the graduating class with a 3.96 GPA from arguably the most elite, most competitive small college in the country. And I did that without doing all the reading. I did most of the reading. My first semester of college, I got one B plus. But then after that, the rest of my undergraduate college career, one year at Oxford University, two years at Cambridge University, a PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, all the rest of that after my first semester, I got no more Bs. It was all As from then on out. And I did all of that doing most of the reading, but not all of it. And what I did, I now realize looking back, was I had a fairly standard method that I would use going into all of my courses, which is I would start off doing all of the reading at the beginning of the semester, and I would adjust down. Uh, the, you know, I would realize, oh, I really didn't have to toil over quite all of that in this course. And so I would dial it down, and I started to get a sense for, in different subjects, there are different expectations for what counts as reading or doing the reading. And I figured that out over the course of my college career. And now, as a college professor, I will ask other faculty, you know, and, and if I press on them, if I ask them repeatedly and push, push back the answers that they give, they will always admit that in their various subjects, in economics and history and geology or whatever, there are little codes for how much of the reading you're supposed to do. You're not always supposed to do all of it, but what is infuriating and frankly unacceptable is that they don't tell you this. You're just sort of expected to pick it up on your own. And I think that that is like unacceptable. And so what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to tell you my impression, at least, of how much of the reading to do for different kinds of courses and that sort of thing. That's actually the first thing I'm gonna do in the first video about reading for college courses. That's this video that you're watching right now is gonna be about all of that. But then I'm gonna record a second video that comes after this where I give you a method for reading, how to read so that you actually retain the information. How to read a text so that you can call it up later. A method, a specific method, the one that I use, and that most academics have sort of figured out a version of this you know, over the course of their career. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna give it to you in the next video after this as to how to read in such a way that you absorb the material into your brain. Uh, but that's the next video. This video is about how much of the reading to do in different courses. I just wanna emphasize the general point that you should not go into a college course you know, strategizing about how to do as little of the reading as possible. You want to do all or almost all of the reading. Doing the reading before every lecture 
is the main thing that will make your college courses easier and your time and effort in those courses more efficient. Because, like, you're going to class anyway, right? You're, you're spending that, let's say, one hour in lecture anyway. And if you've done the reading in advance, then you have a sort of background, you know, base of knowledge that you can use to absorb more out of that one hour. You're using that hour of lecture more efficiently. And you end up making the course easier. Because if you do the reading beforehand, and then go to lecture, you're gonna understand all that lecture, and then you're just gonna understand what's going on in the course. Instead of, if you don't do the reading, you get much less out of lecture, and then you have to teach yourself the material in like the three days before the final exam, and that makes the course harder. And one more thing about doing the reading before class, if you do all of the reading for a course, it will make the course more interesting. You'll just be able to understand what's going on, and you'll be able to go through a professor's often mediocre lecture and find the interesting stuff. You'll see it. It'll appear to you, oh, this is actually really cool. This is really interesting. You're only gonna find that if you do the reading and understand the material. And then your whole college career, this really can happen, it happened to me. Your whole college career will be filled with interesting, fun, stimulating stuff. This is almost always ignored, but it is an incredible benefit of doing the reading in your college courses. Let's go through the four types of courses that I started this video with. These aren't obviously all of the types of courses um, that you can encounter at a university, but anyway, philosophy is my subject, right? I'm an assistant professor of philosophy here at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. In most philosophy courses, the readings are short and incredibly dense and you must read every single word of them. Often you will have to read it multiple times in order to figure out what's going on. Students often don't believe me when I tell them that reading the reading multiple times will really continue to reward them with new insights, but it will, but sometimes they don't believe me, and whatever, what can you do? It's different in some other subjects, like, for example, history. Now, some history courses We'll just assign like one chapter of a book for each meeting of the course. Typically lower level history courses, 100 level, 200 level history courses, they'll assign one chapter per meeting of the course, something like that. If that's the case, you have to read that whole chapter before that meeting. But many history courses will assign way more texts. Like you'll read 20 books over the course of the semester, or sometimes I'll see a syllabus for an undergraduate history course, and it'll be like 35 books. 35 books? What? In one course, in one semester? But then you ask these historians, and you discover, oh, you're really not supposed to read the whole thing. Because how could you? What you do is, you read the introduction, you pick one chapter in the book to, to read also, a chapter somewhere in the middle that you find interesting, you skim all the rest of them, um, and then you read the conclusion. But I want to note something about skimming. Why are you skimming at all? Like, what, like skimming isn't reading, you know? <laughs> it's just like, you don't get the information, you just get a vague sense for the topic. That's what you want. You want a vague sense for the topic. So if you're going to skim properly, here's the way it works. Let's say you're reading a book, a history book, I'm reading a history book right now, just for fun, about the history of town swimming pools in the United States of America. Right? Municipal swimming pools that are like, you know, the town pool. Okay, I'm reading this book for fun right now, uh, this book about the history of swimming pools. You know, you've got your intro chapter, maybe a conclusion chapter or whatever. If you're assigned this book for, for one course meeting, you'd read the intro and the conclusion, and then you'd skim through the whole book. And then you go to class. And let's say the professor spends like 20 minutes of class talking about the municipal pools in Philadelphia, you know, in the 1890s. Like, that's the chapter that I just read two nights ago was about Philadelphia swimming pools in the 1890s. Okay, so the professor spent 20 minutes of like a 50-minute lecture on the Philadelphia swimming pools. Okay, you skimmed the book, and so you know, oh, there was a chapter about the Philadelphia pools. If the professor spent a lot of time on that, 
then after class, that same night or the next day before the next class or whatever, you go back and read that whole chapter and really read it. And that's how you take advantage of skimming. The point of skimming the book uh, before class was so that you could recognize during lecture, oh, there's a whole chapter about this thing he's talking about. I know where that chapter is. It's, you know, chapter three or four. And so then after class, you know, oh, and where is it? Oh yeah, it's chapter four. And then you read chapter four. Okay, let me explain something about what I mean by science courses here. I don't just mean hard science like chemistry and physics. I also mean social science courses. So this includes economics and uh, sociology, some sociology courses even, courses with a textbook. Well, here's the thing about a textbook. A textbook is written for you, right? So in my philosophy courses, most of the readings are not written for you. Like, we'll read, for example, The Meditations on First Philosophy by René Descartes. Descartes was a French mathematician and philosopher who lived in the 17th century, and he published The Meditations in 1641, I think. Uh, and they were written in Latin. They were not written for 18-year-old college students in the 21st century. No, they were written for other like mathematicians who could read Latin. The advantage of a textbook is that it was written for you. It was written in the last 10 or 15 years, right? And it was written with the specific audience of, you know, um, late teens, early 20 college students in mind. Now here's what will sometimes happen in science and social sciences courses with a textbook. Sometimes the professor will say, I had professors that said this to me, oh, you don't have to read the textbook. Like, the textbook is there, and they might tell you which chapter of the textbook corresponds to the material that they're covering in class, but the professor will often say something like, well, look, I'm gonna cover it in class, and if you pay attention and take really good notes during lecture, then you don't have to bother reading the textbook, though it's there for you as a resource if you want to refresh things or go over them again. After lecture, you can read the corresponding chapter. Professors will sometimes say that reading the textbook in a course like this is optional. It is not. Do not trust your professor when they say this. And here's three reasons why you shouldn't trust them. They overestimate their own abilities. Specifically, faculty often overestimate their own ability to explain things well to students. The textbook was written and rewritten in multiple drafts and it was read by editors. When your professor just gets up to explain something to you in a lecture hall, they just get up and start talking. I mean, they may have lecture notes that they're looking at, right? But they will fumble some things on the fly. And so they will overestimate their own ability to explain everything really well. So that's one reason not to rely entirely on the lectures. Here's the other reason not to trust them when they tell you that you don't have to read the textbook before class. They've forgotten what it's like to be a student. Or more precisely, in their own subject matter, they have forgotten what it's like to not already totally understand this material. If they're teaching an introductory level course with a textbook, they've gone over this material a dozen times over the last dozen years or more. They know this stuff cold. So all they do is they like glance at their lecture notes and they're like, oh yeah, that thing. So for them, of course, the fact that they say it to you once in lecture, well, that should be enough to understand it because for them, it's enough to understand it. But if it's the first time for you and you don't already basically know all of this stuff, then having, having read it once in the textbook and then having it reinforced again in the lecture that's, it's not just helpful, that's basically necessary. There's no other way that you're gonna absorb this new material if you, don't, if you don't set things up so that you get it twice, once in written form and once you know, presented to you orally. And the third reason why not to trust your professor if they tell you, oh, you don't have to read the textbook. Here's the third reason. The exams for the course, they may come from the textbook. That is, sometimes, Professors will write their own exams, but sometimes they will get from the publisher of the textbook an exam that's already created that fits the textbook. And if the exam comes from the textbook, you need to rely on the textbook to know what the right answers on that exam are and not, you know, what your professor happens to say in class. The phrasing of everything should match what's going to be on the exam, and so you need to read the textbook. Here's a test that you can use to tell, not 100% of the time, but most of the time, in advance, you can tell whether the exam will be 
made by the publisher of the textbook or whether the exam will be made by the professor themselves. Here's what you do. You read the textbook before lecture. You read it thoroughly and you understand it. Just the chapter, one chapter that corresponds to whatever is going to be covered in class that day. It'll say on the syllabus, you know, which is the right chapter. Okay, you read that chapter thoroughly. Take good notes. Then you go to class, you listen carefully, you take good notes, and you find a discrepancy or two. So then you go to the professor's office hours, and you ask them, so in the textbook it says X, but in lecture you said not X. So which is it? Is it X or not X? If they say, oh, uh, well, yeah, I said that in class, but really you should trust the textbook. Um, what they, they said it the better way, and that's the right thing. If they say that, then the chances that the exam comes from the textbook go way up. But if instead they say, don't listen to that textbook. I know Professor So-and-so who wrote that textbook at, so at such and such university. I've met them a dozen times at conferences, and they're a fool. So don't listen to them. I, what I said in lecture is the right thing. If they say that, then the likelihood that they themselves made the exam goes up. But when you get to more advanced science courses and social science courses, um, you'll no longer be reading textbooks that are written for 18-year-olds. You'll now be reading articles that are written for other people with PhDs in that subject and that are published in academic journals. In most scientific disciplines, you should feel this out over the course of the first few weeks of the semester, but in most scientific disciplines, you're not really expected to read every word of that article. You read some of the introductory material, some of the conclusion -y material, and then there are figures and captions. The figures are just images that appear throughout the paper, right? So one type of image might be like, I don't know, a, a graph, like a bar graph. That's a type of image. Here, here's your bars, okay, and your bar graph, right? Or a map, if you're taking a geology course, it'll be a map of like a basin. What is a basin? I don't know. And then there'll be little like things that specify things on this map. Maybe there's a river. I don't know how geology works. You have these figures, these images of whatever kind they are for whatever kind of article it is. And then you have the captions, which are like the tiny little words that are under the, the images. These are, in most sciences, more important than the main text. So what you want to do is you want to focus on the images look at them really carefully, study them, go through every point on them, and read very, very carefully the captions below the images that are supposed to explain what's going on in the various figures. That is often more important than the main text. And none of your science professors will tell you this, or rarely they will, and that's just like totally unacceptable that these are the things that you're supposed to focus on, and, and they don't tell you that. Obviously, I have not gone through every type of course offered at a typical university. Here's the general method that you want to use. Read everything starting at the beginning of the semester. Read everything that's on the syllabus before the day that that material is going to be covered in class. And then as the semester goes on, you can dial it down slowly and carefully. If you read something and you're like, we didn't discuss any of this. I read this whole book for, for class on Tuesday. And we only basically talked about this one broad idea that was basically covered entirely in the intro. If that happens to you, then you're like, oh, I don't have to read quite the whole thing. You start by reading everything and you dial it down over the course of the semester. That's the way to do it, not the opposite way. The opposite way is how most students do it, right? They think, I don't want to do all the reading. I'm too busy with whatever else I got going on. I like, I play Dungeons and Dragons or, or badminton or football or whatever. I'm busy with other stuff that I'm doing and I don't want to do the reading. And so what the students do is they, they say, well, I'm going to start off the semester by not doing any of the reading. And then if I start to struggle, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up and I'll start doing the reading, you know, after a few weeks or whatever. No, that won't work. That is a recipe for failure, a recipe for disaster because it's going to be too late. You're too far behind. Because the way that courses are structured, in all college courses, the way that courses are structured is that the, the material at the beginning is the most important because you build on that throughout the semester. And so if you really didn't get that stuff at the beginning because you weren't doing the reading, then you're not going to get the stuff three weeks in, and six weeks in, and 12 weeks into the semester. You have no chance of understanding that stuff if you don't have a solid foundation at the stuff that came first. So don't do the typical thing of not doing the reading at the beginning. If, if it's not one of these types and you're not sure of how much reading to do, start by doing everything before class and then you can slowly dial things down over the course of the semester. The next video in this series of lectures 
is about, as I said before, how to read in such a way that you retain the information so that you can actually remember it and use it later.